and welcome to Mythical Creatures Week 2. Today we're going to be talking all about dragons. I'm really excited for this one. So first we're going to go over real quick again, what exactly is a myth? Well, myths are stories about how the world was created and why certain things happen. Today the word myth is often used to describe something that is not true. But a myth, it's not just a made-up story. Myths can tell of gods, heroes, and events that a group believes, or at one time, believed to be true. So what is a mythical creature? Well, a mythical creature is a supernatural animal, being, or hybrid that doesn't actually exist in real life. Dragons are actually among the most popular and enduring of the world's mythological creatures. Dragon tales are known in many cultures, from the Americas to Europe, from India to China. They have a long and rich history in many forms and continue to populate our books, films, and television shows. It's not clear when or where stories of dragons first emerged, but the huge flying serpents were described at least as early as the age of the ancient Greeks and Sumerians. For much of history, dragons were thought of as being like any other mythical animal sometimes useful and protective, other times harmful and dangerous. The anthropologist David E. Jones has suggested that the dragon myth takes its origins from an innate fear of snakes, which he says could be genetically encoded in humans from the time of our earliest differentiation from other animals. It is true, of course, that it makes sense for us to avoid dangerous animals of every kind, but it is less clear why people should invent stories about imaginary oversized serpents in particular. Nevertheless, there is a clear benefit to tales that warn children against straying into perilous marshy areas where a serpent might seize them, or against scrambling up treacherous mountainsides in search of monsters and treasure hordes. There are also many variations on the dragon myth. Some dragons are terrifying. Others bring good luck. Some swim in the sea. Others fly in the sky. Some breathe fire. Others cause earthquakes. Some have legs, like a lizard. Others are legless, like a snake. China has the longest continuous tradition of dragon stories, dating back more than 5,000 years. In Chinese imagery, dragons symbolize imperial rule and good fortune. The dragons of Chinese legend dwelled in distant waters, and although they usually were wingless, they could fly. Crucially, they brought the rain, hence the fruits of the soil. In the 12-year Chinese zodiac, dragon years are seen as the most auspicious. Hugely popular are the forms of puppet costumes in New Year celebrations, boats and festival races, ornamentation on buildings, and a myriad of other uses. Dragons remain current as a symbol in modern China, just as they were thousands of years ago. India and its South Asian neighbors also have ancient dragon traditions. One even appears on the flag of the small Himalayan nation of Bhutan. Those who stretch the definition of a dragon a bit can even find one in the legends of the Inuit in Canada's Arctic regions. From the West, dragons are said to breathe fire and are seen as unwanted and something that a hero must work to get rid of. These dragons try to kill people who get near them by breathing out fire. They also have great wings and sharp claws. In the Babylonian version, a serpentine deity monster called Tiamat emerged from the sea to threaten all of creation with a return to primordial chaos. The heroic young god Marduk takes up the challenge, slaying Tiamat and rescuing the cosmos. As with other Mesopotamian myths, the Bible contains echoes of this battle. Among other references, the Psalms and the Book of Job tell how the God of Israel vanquished the Leviathan, which is something like a cross between a whale and a snake, which sounds kind of dragon-like, don't you think? From Tiamat to Perseus, it's only a short jump to the standard dragon story of the medieval West, the legend of St. George. 
In the legend's classic form, a venom-breathing dragon terrorizes the Libyan city of Selene. Over time, its required tribute goes from animals to humans, and inevitably, the princess of the land. St. George rides into town on his horse and, learning of the people's plight, agrees to kill the dragon as long as everybody there converts to Christianity. They do, and he does, thereby providing a template for endless medieval illustrations, like the one we see here. This is a painting of St. George and the Dragon, which was painted by Paolo Uccello sometime between 1397 and 1475. Here's St. George defeating the dragon. Another dragon that's been put into art a lot is the one from Beowulf. This is Beowulf battling his nemesis, the dragon, as shown in a 1908 illustration by J.R. Skelton. Here we have an Australian Aboriginal art, Namoroto Spirits and the Rainbow Serpent Burlong. This is depicted as a replica at the Anthropos Pavilion in Chechia. Here's a dragon statue in Slovenia. This is an oil on canvas called The Dragon's Cave by George Janney. It was done in 1917. We don't have any more information about this particular painting, but it is beautiful. There are so many stories about dragons. This one comes from Brazil. It's the legend of the boy Tata. Long ago, there was a time of darkness and worldwide flooding that killed many animals. A hungry anaconda left its cave in search of food and fed on the eyes of the dead, which shone brightly in the darkness. As the anaconda consumed the eyes, its body began to shine, even as it weakened from the not very healthy diet. The serpent died with a great burst of light that escaped to the sun, ending the days of darkness. This story of Boi Tata, or the fiery serpent, originates from Brazil's native Tupi people. Though the creature died, its spirit is said to live on, haunting the Amazon jungles. Today, the Boi Tata can appear at night as glowing fiery eyes, but be careful! Gazing into its eyes can turn you insane. The boy Tata can also breathe fire and will incinerate those who harm the rainforest, either by chopping trees or starting fires. It is even known to disguise itself as a tree trunk and burn alive any lumberjack who tries to chop it down. Here's another story from South Asia of the Pakangba, the Mete dragon. Pakangba is the supreme deity of the Mete mythology or Sanamaihism, a religion that predates Hinduism. He can change forms at will, from human to serpentine, with horns. In total, there is a whopping 364 different forms he can take, all of which are documented in the ancient manuscript Pafal Lambuba. Pakangba is considered the great dragon lord, the ruler and protector of earth and the destroyer of evil. His father, another dragon lord, is the creator of the universe. Today, Panghangba is the heraldic emblem of the Indian state of Manipur. Many people in Manipur understand themselves to be Pakamba's descendants. In Egypt, there's Aphophis, Egyptian god of darkness. Apophis was a powerful feared deity in ancient Egyptian mythology. He was the embodiment of chaos and darkness and the greatest enemy of Ra, the sun god. He was also known as Apep, the serpent of the Nile, the evil dragon, and the lord of chaos. This massive serpent was described as 50 feet in length with a head made of flint he had a terrifying roar that would cause the underworld to rumble and his movements created earthquakes. In South Asia, we also have the Naga, a snake creature. Nagas are alluring and semi-divine beings with human and serpentine attributes. So they look like humans and snakes at the same time. They originate in Hinduism, but also can be found in Buddhism and throughout South and Southeastern 
Asian traditions. Nagas can take three forms, half human and half snake, holy human or holy snake. They're not evil, but they are powerful and easily angered. You definitely don't want to get on a Naga's bad side or get in the way of any treasure they might be guarding. When provoked, a Naga can be an intimidating foe that may spread disaster and disease. Long, the Chinese dragon, is an ancient symbol of power, strength, prosperity, and good luck. Dragons in Chinese culture are kind and wise, and being compared to one is considered a compliment. The dragon was also associated with the emperor of China and represented imperial power during many dynasties. Chinese dragons control water and weather and can bring storms and floods. They rule over moving bodies of water such as waterfalls, rivers, or seas. Traditionally, Chinese villages would come together in times of drought or flooding and make sacrifices and rites to appease the local dragon. Bahumut in, of Islam is closely connected to the behemoth of Hebrew mythology, which was famously described in the book of Job of the Bible. In the Arabian myths, Bahumut is an incomprehensibly massive sea creature who swims in the waters beneath the cosmos. He holds the earth on his back, keeping the structure of the world together. Without him, all of humanity would be plunged into darkness. So dragons have been confused with a lot of creatures throughout history. For instance, the Stegosaurus. It's possible that ancient people may have discovered dinosaur fossils and understandably misinterpreted them as the remains of dragons. Cheng Qiu, a Chinese historian from the fourth century BC, mislabeled such a fossil in what is now the Sichuan province. Take a look at this fossilized Stegosaurus and you might see why they confused it with a dragon. There's also the Nile crocodile, which is native to sub-Saharan Africa. Nile crocodiles may have had a more extensive range in ancient times, perhaps inspiring European dragon legends because they could possibly have wham across the Mediterranean and gotten into Italy or even Greece. They are among the largest of crocodile species, with mature individuals reaching up to 18 feet in length. A giant lumbering crocodile might be easy to mistake for a dragon. Australia is home to a number of species of what are called monitor lizards and they're also referred to as goannas. The large predatory animal has razor sharp teeth and claws, and they are important figures in traditional Aboriginal folklore. At least in Australia, these creatures might be responsible for the dragon myth. Another animal that might have been confused for a dragon is a whale. People argue that the discovery of megafauna, such as whales, may have prompted stories of dragons. Ancient humans encountering whale bones would have no way of knowing that the animals were from the sea, and the idea of such gargantuan creatures might have led people to assume that whales could have been predatory. Because live whales spend up to 90% of their time underwater, they were actually really poorly understood for most of human history. Not only have dragons been mistaken for a lot of creatures, there are a lot of animals that have gotten their names from dragons. For instance, the sea dragon. Locally, these are called leafies but they are also known as the Galartz Sea Dragon. They're found mostly in southern and western coasts of Australia, but they're particularly in South Australia, where they have even been adopted as the state's marine emblem. Next is one you've probably heard of, the Komodo Dragon. If you think of dragons as supersized reptiles with a nasty bite, the Komodo Dragon is the real deal. They grow up to 9.8 feet long and weigh as much as 154 pounds. They are 
without a doubt, the world's biggest lizards. Now, don't get excited because they can't breathe fire. I know. But they do kill pigs, deer, and water buffalo just with their mouths. In the past, it was assumed that bacteria in their saliva caused blood poisoning. But in 2009, scientists discovered that Komodo dragons actually have venomous saliva. And this floods the wounds that are inflicted by their razor sharp teeth. So it's not bacteria. Their saliva is actually venomous. Another animal got, that got their name from dragons is the dragon snake. This animal is native to Indonesia and Malaysia, and it sometimes even turns up in Thailand and Myanmar. It's a mysterious species that goes by several names, including the Javan mud snake, Javan tubercle snake, and rough-backed litter snake. Its mythical name was inspired by its characteristic scales, which you can see in this picture. The word xenodermis means strange skin, and that actually refers to the rows of knobbly black scales that run in raised ridges down the snake's body. Dragon snakes commonly measure about two feet in length, and females are a little bit larger than the males. There is only one species of dragon snake. In 2013, a genetic analysis suggested they are a sister group to the primitive aquatic file snakes of Australia and Indonesia. Despite being discovered way back in 1836 and hunting on rice paddies, not mu much is really known about dragon snakes. They mostly hunt at night for frogs. Here we have a bearded dragon. Bearded dragons are a favorite with pet owners around the world. The eight species of the Pagonas genus all come from Central Australia. These dragons actually puff out their throats to create an imposing ruff of spiked scales. This beard also turns black during courtship, aggression, and times of stress. In 2014, it emerged that the central bearded dragon actually changes its shade in sync with its circadian rhythms. It starts the day dark and becomes lighter and lighter, appearing cream at night. The color change may help it absorb heat during the day and then stay warm through cold nights. The central bearded dragon has also surprised scientists with its ability to learn. In 2015, Anna Wilkinson of the University of Lincoln in the UK and her colleagues found that the lizards could imitate a fellow dragon to complete a task, pushing a door open in a particular direction. They can all imitate each other. Next, we have dragonettes. Dragons aren't just restricted to the land and air. In Asian mythology, dragons are often associated with water, and there are many sea animals that are named accordingly. Some of the most attractive are dragonettes, a tropical fish found in the Indo-Pacific. These little dragons are named for their large dorsal fins, which can resemble spectacular articulated wings in species such as the Japanese dragonette and the Seychellus dragonette. Dragonettes are found close to the seabed, and many sport sandy colors to disguise themselves from predators. However, the mandarin fish flaunts a psychedelic mix of electric blue and fierce orange to blend in with its colorful coral reef home in the Pacific. In 2013, scientists found that mandarin fish have unique pigment cells that can glow either blue or red. To protect itself from predators, the mandarin fish secretes a toxin in its thick mucus that covers its body. This slimy mucus is common among dragonets and has an unpleasant smell and taste. This could explain the name Australians have given some of the local species, stinkfish. A lot of people still talk about dragons today and it's mentioned all over the place. In a very popular book series that starts with the book Aragon, there's the dragon Sephira. This is a great dragon book and it's really exciting and there's 
four in the series, and we have them here in OCLs. And of course, as a lot of you probably already know, dragons end up being pretty popular within the Harry Potter book series. The Hungarian horn tails were also known for being one of the most vicious and aggressive breeds of dragon. And that's saying something since all dragons in the Harry Potter universe are known to be ferocious. And even Hagrid comments on it, saying that the Horntail was a right nasty piece of work. This breed is especially aggressive when protecting their young. They're also really, really fast when they're flying and are even able to keep up with a firebolt broomstick. And that broom is capable of going from zero to 150 miles per hour in 10 seconds. Another popular dragon in literature is Dragon from Game of Thrones. It was one of the three dragons born in the wastelands. He belongs to Daenerys and is her personal mount. The Hobbit also has a pretty famous dragon called Smog. It is a fire drake from the Third Age and is considered to be the last great dragon to exist in Middle-earth. Another amazing dragon is Elliot from Pete's Dragon. This was a really famous movie when I was younger, and they just remade it recently as a live action movie. Elliot is a green dragon, and he actually befriends a young orphan named Pete. He is the only animated character in either of the films. Elliot can fly, breathe fire, and even turn invisible. So if you're looking for a nice dragon, I would definitely check out Pete's dragon. And of course, we would be remiss if we did not mention Toothless and his mate from the How to Train Your Dragon book and movie series. It has not only been in books and movies that dragons are still popular today. Also, a really popular video game series called Spyro has a pretty amazing dragon in it. Of course, there's Mushu from the 1998 Disney movie Mulan, which was voiced by Eddie Murphy and he would definitely be considered a friendly dragon. Another dragon that is not quite so friendly is Maleficent, who's actually a fairy that has the ability to transform into a fire-breathing dragon. If you're interested in reading more books about dragons and all of the things that they get involved with, check out Orangeburg County Library. We have a lot of books that have dragons in them here, and here's a couple of selections. How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cowell, Aragon by Christopher Paolini, The Deer Dragon series, specifically here we have Deer Dragon Goes to the Library by Margaret Hillert, Wings of Fire by Tui T. Sutherland, and There's a Dragon in Your Book by Tom Fletcher. Again, this is just a small collection of all the dragon books we have here at the library, and we would love to be able to help you find your next great dragon read. I hope you guys enjoyed learning all about dragons. I certainly did. I cannot wait for the dragon craft. So I will be back in just a second, and we will make ourselves a dragon headdress. I'll see you then. Hi, everybody, and welcome to week two of Mythology Crafts. I hope you enjoyed all of that awesome information you just heard about dragons. And now we are going to be making our dragon craft. So first thing you're going to need is your mythology bag. And inside of that, you are going to pull out the dragon bag. In here, you're going to find a selection of things. First, we have our dragon headdress instructions. And we've got a roll of what looks like just regular paper, but it's actually glue dots. We have, you should have two pieces of stiff felt. And then a small baggie of, uh, or a cup, depending on your bag. You might have all of these in a cup. Mine isn't a baggie of just some different little charms and embellishments as we call them so you've got that now for this craft you are going to need the glue and scissors from your big bag so you know you have your glue and your scissors in your big bag so you are going to need those for this craft so 
have those out too. What's great about this is it's not really messy. Now it can be a little confusing, but if you follow the directions, it's not that hard. And I know you've got this because I've seen all the awesome stuff that you guys make and I know you're gonna be able to do it just fine. So the first thing you're going to do is pick one of the colors of felt. So you've got two different colors. Now one piece is going to primarily be the headband that goes around your head and the base of all of your spines down the back. And the other piece is going to mainly be the spines themselves. So the little stick up points, okay? Then go all the way down. So you want to pick like, which one do you want to primarily be spines and which one do you want to primarily be your, like your headband? So I want my headband to be red. So I'm going to use this red felt first. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to cut two strips from this felt. Now, they're gonna be about, I'm making sure, see I'm looking at my directions to make sure I tell you guys the right thing so I don't wanna accidentally give you the wrong information. So I'm gonna cut two one inch strips along the long end of the felt. So this is the short end and this is the long end and we're wanting to cut along the long end of the felt and we're looking at about one inch so it's not going to be as big as you think now if these are not perfect that's a-okay they do not have to be perfect one inch you don't need a ruler I don't have a ruler here you can see that so I'm just going to use my scissors to cut one inch strips here now the scissors we included are children's scissors if you want to use a different pair that you have at your house, make sure to talk to an adult before you just use any kind of scissors you have and make sure to be careful because even children's scissors can be sharp and I don't want anyone to get hurt. So there's one strip and then I'm going to cut one more. It's actually like the third headdress I've made. You'd think I'd have it memorized, but I don't want to give wrong information. So I have cut two about one inch strips from my long felt. So you can see two of them. All right. Now I'm going to take this big piece. I'm going to set it to the side. I'm going to use that again in a second. So I've got my two long pieces. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take one of my glue dots here. So I'm going to unroll my paper and I'm going to take a glue dot. You got to kind of pry it off that backing. It doesn't really like to come off the backing. And I'm going to put it at the end of one of my strips, just like this. And then I'm going to put the other one and I'm going to put it right on top like that. And then I'm going to press down and I'm going to count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Blah. There we go. Good. That doesn't want to come apart. I was pulling each of these ends here and it doesn't want to come apart very easily. So you really want to make sure that that glue adheres because this felt is really thick. So it likes to move around. So I like to kind of just make sure it's really on there. If your starts to come off, you can try some of the liquid glue as well. Or um, if, you're, if your adult wants you to, you can staple it and that's totally okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to measure our head here. So we're going to go and take the felt strips around your head and you're going to figure out how, where you, how big your head is. Now my head is big because I have a big head. So mine's going to be wider than yours. If you're measuring your head, you might be attaching it a lot further down. That's okay. That's why we made it as big as we did. So it'll fit an adult or a child. So for my head, I need to attach it really close to the edge. So I'm going to take another glue dot here. Peel that off. We gave you more glue dots than you probably end up needing to use, but I always believe it's better to have too much than not enough. I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna take my two ends and I'm gonna cross them together like this. And then I'm going to squeeze. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. And I'm going to move it around a little bit to really get that on there. Pull. See, that one's pulling a little bit more, so I'm going to squeeze it a little bit longer. Just really make sure that's on there. There we go. There we go. That's better. And now I have the circle for my head. Oh, awesome. So I'm going to put this over to the side. All right. And I'm going to take the rest of my head here. So I've got this. And I'm going to cut three more long one-inch strips. Three more. So I get my scissors back. And I'm going to cut three more long-inch strips. I really enjoyed making um, that presentation for you guys about dragons. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I could not have done that without Laura here at the library, which you guys know, Miss Laura, because she did a lot of the research for me. Actually, I want to be honest, she did all the research for me because um, she is very knowledgeable about dragons already, so it was a lot easier for her, so I could not have done that without Miss Laura. All right, and that's two strips, and I need one more. There we go. And I'm going to take this piece that I have left over, I'm going to put it over here, because I don't need it right now. Scissors. And then I have my three strips three strips, long strips. Okay. Now I'm going to do the same thing I did in the beginning of this. I'm going to take the ends and I'm going to use a glue dot and glue them together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You didn't know you were going to get counting practice today, did you? We're going to be able to count to ten very thoroughly by the time we're done with this. And then one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten. That wasn't very good. I'm going to do that again. This is a test of strength. You got to make the face or it's not going to adhere right. I'm kidding. You don't have to make the face. Okay. So now I've got this really long strip. You see this really long strip here? All right. So this is the part that I found the description was the most confusing on how I was supposed to do this, but I think it's actually pretty easy. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your circle headband, right? And you're going to put it down on the table in front of you. And then you're going to take one end of your long strip and you're going to kind of curve it up like this, like an arch. And you're going to attach one end. And I'm actually going to turn my headband so I'm not putting glue on glue on the same spot because that can add some, it creates a lot of what, what we call tension on one area. So we'll have like multiple pieces kind of pushing against each other. So it's easier on here. That will make the glue actually, it'll be a stronger space because there's not already a joined piece here. So this is actually going to be a stronger Grip. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Like that. Now, what you're going to do is you want it to lift off your head. You want it to go over your head. So it doesn't, you don't want to do it straight across like this because then it's not going to be above your head. You want it to have a bit of a 
push up like an arch. You want to leave that arch in there. That's the, that's the complicated part. So you figure out how much arch you feel like you need. And then you're going to attach another glue dot. See how this, this side is inside the band? This side here is going to be outside the band. Inside, outside. This is the most complicated part, guys. I promise. When I was writing the directions, I was like, oh, this is confusing sounding. But once you see it, it's pretty easy, right? I know. So again, I'm not going to do it right on the same spot as the other glue dot. I'm not going to do it here. Okay, I'm going to do it right here. I'm going to just put that glue dot on there. Get it off my maker. Okay. And then attach it and squeeze and count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Try to kind of move it around a little bit. There we go. Oh, that is nice and solid on there. So now you can try it on. Oh, yeah. We're looking. We're looking awesome, right? And then look, you got this long piece behind you. Now, I'm really tall. So my long plate piece only goes to about like halfway down my back. Your long piece might go like all the way down to your feet. It depends. We don't know. You might end up saying, well, this is way too long and you want to cut some of this tail off. And that's okay. Completely up to you. So now we've got the basis for our dragon headpiece here, headdress here, okay? So we're going to set that aside and we're going to go to the next piece here. So I'm going to turn to the second page. So that's all the first page. And then you're going to, on the second page, and you might not need the instructions because you're watching the video. And this is what we do with the other piece of stiff felt. So I used red for my base here, my skeleton. And then I have blue and I'm going to use blue for my spines. So you're going to cut the short side here. You're going to cut up this way. Okay. Not this way, not the long way, the short way. Okay. Not this way, this way. All right. So I've got that and I am going to cut seven strips. Now these strips need to be a little bit thicker. So we did about one inch for the first strips for our spine, okay, or for our, our skeleton, our basis, but for the spines, we're going to do about one and a half inch to two inch. It, I, I wouldn't do quite two inches if you can help it, but honestly, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. So I'm going to just cut right like this. See that? And there's six and seven and look at how uneven my last two strips are. And I think one of these might be about three inches and you know what? It's all right. It's just going to make my dragon look even more unique and that is okay. Now here is the part where you can do this if you want. So I have a little bit of red left over and I kind of think it might be cool if I had some red spines mixed in there. But since my felt is so much shorter because I've already used a bunch of it, these are going to be tiny spikes. I think that's cool. So I'm going to cut some of these too. And you know what? I might use them. I might not. I don't know, but why not? All right. So now we've got all of our, here's my little tiny rectangles here. I got my tiny strips. And then I also have my big, my seven big blue ones. So now we're ready to make our spines. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to fold these strips in half. This is called the hamburger fold. Okay. And you just want to fold it in half so that you can see the crease. It's going to pop right back open because we've got this stiff felt and that's okay. See it popped right back open, but you can see that there's a crease in there and that's good. This is called the hamburger fold. So you're going to take your strip here and you're going to fold it uh, like that. Hello. <laughs> See, this could be a lot of fun. You can make this a lot of fun. You can even have two of them talking to each other if you want. 
Look at that. Hello. Just fold them enough so that you can see that crease line. I'm going to do my little red ones too, but I'm not going to take as much time on those. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Bam. All right, so we're going to take that first one we made a crease in, and now we're going to fold it back into that hamburger. Mm -hmm. We're going to take that first one that we made the little crease in. We've got our hamburger fold here. All right. Now what we're going to do is down at the fold, okay, at the fold, you're going to cut along the edge to make it into a triangle. And you can start the cut up here if you want. There we go. Now we've got a nice triangle. And I'm going to do that with every single one of these. So I will be back in a moment with all of my strips cut. So I will see you in a minute or two. All right, so welcome back. I have finished cutting my spines and I decided to only cut four of my reds. So as you can see, I took, I took the rectangle, okay? And I just went whoop and whoop and that's it. And I did that, ooh, they're popping out of my hand. I did that on all of these here so I've got the seven blue and I've got the four red and I think the blue and the red go really well together I think everybody who made these bags we had a lot of people working on making these kits for you guys all of the staff here was helping out and um, I think they did an amazing job because this is a great color combination here so I'm gonna put these slightly to the side and I'm gonna pull my skeleton here back up all right so what you and you need your glue dots. Don't forget your glue dots. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put the spine underneath here, and you're gonna just fold it over like this. When you put these on, you're gonna put a glue. You're gonna put two glue dots. But you have to decide: are you gonna do your small ones, big ones? So I'm trying to think here. When I think of a dragon, I think of the front. I feel like the front spines, the spines closest to the head, are probably bigger and then they get tinier the way they go down, right? Yeah, I think maybe, I don't know, do whatever you want. That's the best part about this. So I'm gonna take a glue dot here and I'm going to put it right here in the middle of my cut triangle, right like this, right in the middle. And then I'm going to pick where I want my first spine to be you can do it over here, you can do it up here. It's really up to you. I'm going to do mine right here. And I'm going to squeeze it together just like we've been doing. Squeeze. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice and squared. Then I'm going to take another glue dot. And I'm going to put it up here closer to the tip. And then I am going to squeeze them together. right like that and you can kind of if you want to really get it on there and then you're just going to continue down your dragon doing the same thing and you can even do all your glue dots those first glue dots you can put all your glue dots on at once here Well, you don't have to keep going back and forth. All 
I got little pieces of felt. actually ended up a little shy on my glue dots and that's okay it'll give me an opportunity to show you guys how to use the clear glue so now that I've got my glue dots on my spines I'm going to just go down my dragon's back here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten Alright, so for this one, I'm going to do just this one glue dot. My dragon has an open spine at the end. Oh, what about that? That might be cool, right? Look at that. We're making it creative and unique. I love it. Let's just leave that spine open. I think that'd be good. Now, the embellishments. So the embellishments are optional. You don't have to use them, but I will tell you the glue works for this. And I think it's because one side is not where the embellishments themselves are not porous. It lets the glue like adhere better. I'm not really a hundred percent sure why it works, but it does. So I'm only going to do a couple embellishments. I really, I've got a whole bunch of different stuff in here. And you guys have a whole bunch of different stuff in yours too, but I'm not going to do too many. So I'm going to put a little bit of glue here on my dragon's spine. And then I'm going to just put that gem in there and I'm just going to let it sit there for a minute like that. And then maybe I'll put a clear one here. I like that. Ah, too much glue. It's okay. Just let it sit. Let it sit one here. I really like the idea of leaving this one spine open. I think that works really well. In fact, I think I'll put, I think I'll decorate my open spine here. Put a heart on one side. And do you think I should put another heart on the other side? I'll do a different color. There you go. Because my dragon is a friendly dragon. And I want people to know that, so he'll have a heart, and then people will know he's friendly. She's friendly. It's friendly. Hmm. It could be anything. Dragons. They're awesome. All right, I kind of want another one of these teardrops here. Oh, I'll put the glue on that. that well, that's going to be messier, so don't do that. Only put it on the felt. Yeah, see, it's adhering just fine to the jewels. I think it's just the felt on felt, so. But you guys would have enough, you guys should have enough glue dots. And then here on my headband part, I want to put, I think I'll put a couple flowers on the headband here. And again, if you don't have enough glue dots, that's a-okay. Like I said, you can use a, um, a stapler to hold your spines together, or you can even leave some of your spines open like I did on my last one, which I think ended up making my dragon look like super, super cool. I really like that I left that open. I need another flower right here. I need another flower. There we go. Must be done. Awesome. Okay, now, if I was at your house, we would let this sit for a while before we put it on because we don't want to get glue in our hair because I want you guys to be able to see this on me. 
I'm going to go ahead and put mine on and just hope I don't get any glue in my hair. Okay. Look at that. Look at what we just made. Oh my goodness. So cool. Right? Awesome job. This was so much fun. I cannot wait for next week. So make sure to watch uh, next week's video as well. And don't forget, I would love to see your dragon headdress. So send us pictures on Facebook of your completed art, uh, mythology creature. And don't forget to fill out the survey that's attached to this video. And I cannot wait to see you next week. Have a great day. Bye.